Where do people get their ideas? In the case of this video, I took my general distaste for the work of noted conspiracy theorist and soy hater Paul Joseph Watson and decided to follow his work for a week and tabulate the many omissions, poor framings, and outright lies that shape his work. But something weird happened along the way. I had decided upon the week of January 14th, 2019 as my starting point. But with the very first article, my whole idea fell apart and I fell into a weird rabbit hole. The article in question is titled, Leftist French Website Calls for Heterosexuality to be Banned, published on January 14th on Infowars, the home of conspiracy theories and pending litigation for slander. Watson's article is a less than favorable framing of a piece by Mérom Jardin, titled Interdire l'heterosexuality for the French outlet media part. And I apologize for that terrible French pronunciation there. Watson's article describes the content of the Jardin piece and includes some generally negative remarks, but doesn't go into it too deeply. The first question I had was, does Paul Joseph Watson speak French? He has a lot of translated sections of the original French article, but he doesn't really attribute it to anyone. So where did these translations come from? Did he just come up with them on his own? So I decided to look this up. It led me to, as far as I can tell, one of the few English language articles about the Jardin piece that wasn't just a reposting of the Watson article from Infowars. It was posted on a blog called Diversity macht frei, which Google Translate tells me is German for diversity power free. But more about the blog in a bit. The article, Call for Heterosexuality to be Banned in France, was published on January 12th, 2019 two days before the Watson article. I know you're all probably thinking, ooh, a plagiarism case. Uh, sort of. There's actually something much more interesting going on here, so just hang in there for a moment. The first thing I noticed about the blog post is that it's strikingly similar to the Watson article, so much so that every quoted section from the Watson article is an exact match for the blog article. Translation is not an exact science. Translations may contain subtle differences, depending on the translator. Take, for example, these translations of the first paragraph of the French article. I sourced both of these individually, and even when you take into consideration that words such as sexism and biphobia are typically only translated in one way, you can still see the subtle differences in the translation that show different people worked on them. The first paragraph is included in both the Watson and the Diversity Macht Frey blog article, and they are identical. There is no difference between them whatsoever, aside from a few opening words that the Watson quote cut off. In fact, every quoted section is identical aside from the word femicide, which was spelled incorrectly as feminicides in the Diversity blog. I suppose it was nice of Watson to correct the spelling there. But going further than the quotations, take a look at all these additional claims in the Watson article that aren't just quotes from the original Jardin article. Every single one of them can be found in the translated sections, originally posted in the Diversity blog. That may not sound like a big deal, since they're talking about the same French article. Why wouldn't they make the same claims? Except, the translation on the Diversity blog only includes four paragraphs from the original French article 17 not counting the concluding sentence. Now what are the odds that the Watson article, supposedly based on having read the original French article in its entirety, would have happened to hit the exact same points as this blog post that translated less than a quarter of the article's content? But we're not done yet. The final few paragraphs of the diversity blog read, the bio of the author, Merome Jardin says he was a member of Act Up Paris, 1998 to 2013, a gay campaigning group, and is a member of CCIF, Collective Against Islamophobia, which is hilarious since I don't think this guy will last long after the Muslim takeover of France. Watson's article ends, The irony behind the piece is that Jardin is also a member of the CCIF, Collective Against Islamophobia. One wonders how his opinion will be received amongst France's Muslim population, which currently stands at almost 9%. Kind of strange how they ended on the exact same point, isn't it? Although Watson, I suppose, gets some 
tiny bit of credit for adding the factoid about the Muslim population of France in an article that has nothing to do with Islam. Funny how that worked out. Countless writers have taken the work of others, synthesized or built upon it in some way. Typically though, they add more than just a random stat at the end. And even more typically, they actually credit their source. At the very least, Watson should credit the diversity blog for the translation. Although that might expose how little work he did for this article. And it might expose something else as well. Diversity macht frey. You can get a sense of what this blog is about by checking out some of their articles. There are a few overlaps with Watson's Infowars work. We have these two articles about a woman in Germany being pulled over for wearing braids. The Diversity Blogs article is dated January 8th, the Watson article January 9th. There's an article here about the French Green Party founder saying Europeans should have less children to make room for migrants. Diversity Blogs article is dated January 4th, Watson's is dated January 11th. And an article about Germany issuing a manual to schools warning about signs of, according to Watson's article, right-wing parents, and according to Diversity Blogs article, Nazi parents. The Diversity Blogs article is dated December 4th, the Watson article December 5th. In many of these cases, Watson, to his credit, does more to build on the story than the Diversity Blog does, enough to make it seem as if he got these stories from somewhere else. And heck, maybe he did. It's entirely possible that the Diversity Blog and Watson just run in the same circles and cover a lot of the same stories using similar themes, such as the left trying to destroy Europe via immigration. Although, when it comes to that first article, responding to the Jardin piece, I can't assume that's just a coincidence. The articles are way too similar. One is clearly lifted from the other. But this isn't just a case of plagiarism. There's a bit more to that diversity blog than I've told you so far, and it's pretty ugly. While Watson is happy to cover the same stories as the blog when it applies to conservatives supposedly being under attack in Europe, he doesn't really touch the other stories the blog pushes out on a regular basis. Articles with titles such as A Very Jewish Coup, The Plot to Stop Brexit, Rich Muslim states are hiring Jews to sell Islam to Christians via interfaith institutes. As Christians celebrate Christmas with their families, Jews fantasize about their savior crawling through excrement. So, uh, yeah, this blog is probably run by a Nazi. And if you need a little more evidence than that, one of the few places that loves to repost this blog's content happens to be the home for neo-Nazi scum on the internet, the Daily Stormer. This is definitely a Nazi's blog, and the Daily Stormer has had an interesting relationship with Paul Joseph Watson over the years. In short, they don't like him. At all. Not because they disagree with the vast majority of his talking points, though. As one 2015 article describes it, Watson is known for ripping off the Daily Stormer and other pro-white sites and removing Jews from the discussion. Now, if the Daily Stormer said the sky was blue, I'd look out the window to check, but there's clearly a kinship between Watson and the site. Watson portrays the Daily Stormer as being hostile towards him, but this doesn't result from some kind of profound ideological divide. He says in this tweet they attack him, and that's true, but only insofar that Watson doesn't quite go far enough to call out their imaginary menace that's supposedly the source of all the evils in the world this case, it would be the Jewish people. Which they're obviously wrong about. <laughs> Do I have to say that? Do I have to say they're wrong? I'm gonna say it anyway. They're totally wrong about the Jews being behind everything. That's a hideous conspiracy theory. Watson's career has largely been spent working for Alex Jones and Infowars. Perhaps his single biggest work is a 2005 book titled Order Out of Chaos, a diatribe about how the US government was responsible for 9-11. One telling line with him describes briefly how Watson believes the world works, particularly in how it relates to the Jewish people. Many people identify Zionism and the expansion of Israel as the head of the New World Order Hydra. In reality, Israel is just another tentacle of the beast. The globalists do not owe allegiance to any particular country. They will use any nation or movement as muscle to ram through their agenda. So the point of contention between the likes of Watson and Stormfront is simple. They both believe in the same theory of a group of global elites controlling the world. Only Watson won't claim that the group is exclusively Jewish. 
Instead, he sees it as some sort of sinister left-wing cabal that is using identity politics to, I don't know, make everyone gay, I guess. What's so frustrating about these commentaries is that they're not completely wrong about the world being organized in a way that favors a ruling class over all others, but instead of trying to create a broad international coalition of the people against those who would oppress them, they either scapegoat a religious minority or pretend that fascism is going to save us. These obviously aren't real solutions. In an article by Nico Hines of the Daily Beast, we got a deep look into Watson's history, particularly how he got his story ideas in the past. He's a talented guy in that way, able to spit out these fake news stories very quickly. This comment comes from Kelly Jones, Alex Jones's ex-wife, who previously had a fairly heavy hand in running the operations of InfoWars. According to Kelly Jones, much of Watson's prolific career writing for InfoWars would involve Jones reciting ideas to Watson over the phone, who would then turn them into articles. If anything, this demonstrates Watson has a history of repackaging the ideas of, well, unbalanced individuals. If we want to know what motivates Watson, Kelly Jones can actually offer us a possible explanation describing her time managing the prison planet, eventually InfoWars, payroll. Early, early on, Paul Watson was making monthly what people make in a year. We're talking about the kind of money that would drop jaws. Before I go further, I should mention Watson called this article a hit piece, although throughout the article they cite government records and interviews with many of his former friends and colleagues. That seems quite credible. Watson's only critique after the article came out was the tweet below. None of the information Kelly Jones provides has anything to do with knowing Watson personally and is used to provide context of his working relationship with her husband. The Daily Beast article suggests, quite strongly, that Watson's intense suspicion about the government, as seen in his earlier writings where he pivots to conspiracy theories in the face of any and all public tragedies, has slowly moved towards a more xenophobic variation. We can see a great example of Watson's race to a conspiracy theory answer in one of his early 2015 videos where he actually came out against Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a stooge for Hillary Clinton. He's a plant. He's a ringer to sink the chances of Republican candidates who actually have a chance of defeating Hillary. Watson claimed to have evolved on this issue. Just how he evolved, I think, can be more easily summed up in these three tweets. In the context of Donald Trump threatening military action in Syria off the heels of a chemical weapon attack, Watson posted these three tweets within a 14-hour period. I guess Trump wasn't Putin's puppet after all. He was just another deep state neocon puppet. I'm officially off the Trump train. First time I've ever lost Twitter followers. Interesting. I am off the Trump train in terms of Syria, which I will criticize. But I have not turned on Trump, as the media claims. Fake news. I suspect the truth of Watson's motivations lie in the second tweet in that little three-act Twitter play. Watson has an audience, an audience that makes him a lot of money. He'll say what he needs to, to keep getting paid. It's difficult to say whether or not Watson is entirely disingenuous, though. Maybe he flirts with more extreme viewpoints for the financial benefits, but he certainly built a career being a conspiracy theorist who doggedly challenges the government, often with dreadful, completely wrong-headed conclusions. Although Watson may make himself presentable and make a concentrated effort to appear reasonable, he's still repackaging crackpot commentary as his own. Whether it's in service to genuinely agreeing with it, or to make a quick buck, it doesn't really matter. He's trying to stealthily insert neo-Nazi commentary into the public discourse, and that's bad enough. I want to give a shout out to my Twitter followers who helped me out with the translations for the, for the first paragraph of the Jardine article. One asked to remain anonymous, but the other one is Timba on Toast, whose YouTube channel you should totally check out. He has a fantastic video on Dave Rubin, and I know a thing or two about Dave Rubin videos. If you enjoy this video, I highly recommend you like it, leave a comment, and if you haven't already, just subscribe. And if for some reason you can't get it off of me, you can ask me a question on Curious Cat or follow me on Twitter.